Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord of St. Philip Lutheran Church here in Raleigh, North Carolina, for our service of worship and praise this Sunday morning. This is Christ the King Sunday, which closes out another church liturgical year for us uh, and is a day when we celebrate that Christ is our highest allegiance in this lifetime. Uh, we are delighted that you have chosen to worship with us here at St. Philip this morning. Uh, we are blessed by your presence and by your participation in this worship service. So whether you are here in person or online, we welcome you fully in the name of Jesus. Truly, it is good to see you all. If we have any visitors here with us today, we ask that you please remember to fill out uh, the blue and teal card there in the pew racks in front of you so, with me, so that we may have a record of your visitation with us. Uh, you may leave them in the offering plates during offering time or as you depart at the end of service. Um, lastly, we'd like to thank you as always for your continued financial support here of our mission and ministry at St. Philip. Put quite simply, we could not do it without you. We never ever take that for granted and we are more appreciative uh, than you know. Uh, so thank you very much. At this time, we ask that you please rise for the brief order of confession and forgiveness of sin found printed on page two of your bulletin. <clears throat> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Amen. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, you are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is come, ye thankful people, come.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God of power and might, your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. Give us the wisdom to know what is right, and the strength to serve the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's holy word. The first reading is from the 34th chapter of Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I will myself search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flock. Oh, thank you. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry. When they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses and in all inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns you scattered them far and wide i will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged 
and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, and he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Word of God, word of life. We will read responsively from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. For you, Lord, are a great God and a great ruler above all gods. The sea is yours, for you have made it, and your hands have molded the dry land. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hand. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is from the first chapter of Ephesians. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the Lord of the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. Glory Glory to you, you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it 
that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it? that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this new day, a day which we have never seen before. We praise you for the beauty of your creation in the fall. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to once again worship you in spirit and in truth and to share our lives with one another. Uh, we lift up to you now all of our needs for healing and peace and reconciliation, uh, both in the world and in our own hearts and among our own families. We seek a word now, Lord, a word of challenge and conviction, a word of liberation and freedom, a word of hope power, promise, and joy. As your word goes forth, we pray as always that it might be for the salvation of souls, the transformation of lives, the edification of all hearers, the furtherance of your kingdom, and ultimately the glory of your name. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My sermon text for this Christ the King Sunday is the gospel lesson assigned for today, namely Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. My sermon title for this morning is a phrase or a question found four different times in the text in verses 37, 38, 39, and 44. Namely, when was it? When was it? was it? Christ the King Sunday always ends the Christian liturgical year by celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ is our true King as Christians. and The kingdom of God is our chief concern, our true allegiance, and where our ultimate citizenship resides. In the second article of both the Apostles and Nicene Creeds, which are our basic standards of faith, The last thing we confess concerning Jesus is that he will come to judge the living and the dead. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We belong then most fundamentally to a kingdom far greater than our national and political identity as Americans with our cherished values of democracy and capitalism. We belong to a sovereign and judge far more superior than anyone we will ever elect or appoint. This morning's text is challenging, fascinating, provocative. It comes in the fifth great discourse or teaching of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, encompassing chapters 24 and 25, and concerning the end of time the end of this age. Within that teaching, it is the fifth, final, and grand concluding parable, each of which advocates watchfulness and vigilance, wisdom and justice, 
as together we approach the end. Jesus himself in the narrative is approaching his own end, as it were, as these are the last words on his lips before his own passion account begins. The very next verse, just outside of our reading for today, says forebodingly, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Today's text, known as the Great Judgment, is unique to Matthew's Gospel. It has no parallel text in the other Gospel accounts of Mark, Luke, or John. It carries both great weight and provocation for a couple of reasons, chief of which is that it seems to belie, on the face of things, a key Christian doctrine concerning salvation. The vast bulk of the New Testament teaches us that we are saved by grace through faith apart from any works of our own. Ephesians, for example, famously sums up, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not because of your works, lest any of you should boast. And Romans similarly declares, For there is no distinction. Since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, they are justified by His grace as a gift to be received by faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That is, anything you either do or don't do. Much of this thought from the Apostle Paul, the author of those letters, follows upon John's Gospel, wherein the deciding factor is belief or faith in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, God gave His only begotten Son, so that whosoever should believe in Him shall, have, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So the weight and the bulk of the New Testament and traditional Christian teaching, and rightly so, I might add, is that you are saved by belief or faith in Jesus and by God's grace quite independently of anything you have done or not done. It is an utterly free gift from God based on God's goodness and God's initiative. And yet here, the only place in Scripture where Jesus himself teaches on heaven and hell and who goes where and why at the final judgment, at the end of time, nothing is said at all about belief in him or grace or faith or free gift but it is all based on what you do or don't do. And then on top of it, what you do or don't do has nothing to do with what we would call personal holiness or morality or righteousness. You know, the age-old categories of whether or not someone smokes, drinks, curses, fornicates, listens to godless secular music, speaks in tongues, or even is a regular churchgoer for that matter. It is rather based entirely and solely on how one treats others. Now, don't get it twisted, as they say. It all fits together as you study, reflect, and pray. God's free gift of grace and belief in Jesus eventually issues forth in a life of compassion for others. And personal morality certainly has its place. But today's teaching from Jesus is critical, essential, provocative, a cautious, corrective reminder, and bears substantial reflection. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, Jesus declares in the opening three verses, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep at His right hand and the goats at the left. This type of apocalyptic separation was alluded to earlier in Jesus' parables back in chapter 13. Where a separation is made between the wheat and the weeds. The former gathered and the latter burned. And the good fish and the bad fish caught all together in the fishing net. The former put in baskets while the latter are thrown out. For the king will say to those at his right hand, verse 34 says, Come you that are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
here we actually do see grace, meaning unmerited or undeserved favor. Because inherit mean, refers to something you didn't earn, work for, or merit. An inheritance is a gift actually earned by someone else. So if you're among the sheep, you receive an inheritance, a gift, something you fundamentally did not earn. And that is the kingdom of heaven. Interestingly enough, prepared for the sheep from the foundation of the world. Then comes the litany of good works, that righteous deeds in which these sheep have walked. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was imprisoned and you visited me. Notice herein, if you will, a couple of things. First, God's special concern for those who are poor and needy. This is echoed in our first lesson from the prophet Ezekiel where God declares that he himself will begin to shepherd his people. And I quote, I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Secondly, no mention is made here in verses 35 and 36 of whether or not these particular folks of need deserved their plight. It doesn't say, in other words, whether they were lazy, shiftless people who somehow merited their misery or whether they were diligent, industrious folk who simply fell through the cracks and therefore are more deserving of sympathy. There is nowhere here communicated any correlation between personal worth and societal or life outcome. And thirdly, lest you despair of inadequacy, nothing is said either about the amount or the quantity of your response in the text. It doesn't say whether you provided a nine-course meal or a few McNuggets, only that you fed someone who was hungry. It doesn't say whether you gave a bottle of Mondave wine or simply a cup of cold water, only that you gave drink to the thirsty. It doesn't say whether you healed them of cancer or put a cold wash rag on their feverish, heated forehead. You simply saw a need and responded, heard a cry and heeded it, discerned a lack and made provision. Another fascinating and jarring aspect of this text is the reaction of these two groups, the sheep and the goats, to the king's pronouncement. Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it? Somebody say, when was it? That we saw you hungry and gave you food, thirsty and gave you drink, a stranger and welcomed you, naked and clothed you, sick or in prison and visited you. When was it? They say it three times there in three verses. When was it? When was it? When was it? I love this reaction because those who are sheep aren't even aware of it. Those who are righteous are oblivious. Those who provide do so reflexively without even thinking. Those who are going to heaven here don't even know it and seem to be surprised by it. Really? When was it? When did I do that? I don't even recall. Now, when you look at the other side, there's a glaring disparity on a couple of levels. Then he will say to those at his left hand, verse 41 reports, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? The opposite of the above litany. I was hungry and you gave me no food. Thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And what's their response? Verse 44. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? When did we not do it, Lord. 
One way of reading this, my friends, is that the goats are seemingly as shocked as the sheep, but for the opposite reason. They seem to think that they are doing these things and are therefore seemingly indignant that it's even being brought up at all and question, when did we not do it? The sheep and the goats are both unawares. The righteous ask, when did we do these things? While the unrighteous ask, when did we not? Those at the king's right hand are genuinely shocked and pleasantly surprised while those at his left can come across as defensive, smug, or offended. In short, in this parable anyway, those who are going to heaven don't realize it and those who think they are, aren't. It's another one of Jesus' jarring role reversals. Similar to when he said, sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes go into the kingdom of heaven before the priests and religious leaders. Here once again in this scripture, the gospel serves to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. The gospel always comforts the afflicted and afflicted afflicts the comfortable. It all depends on where we find ourselves. The pearl of criterion here is the justifiably memorable verses 40 and 45. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these among you, you did it unto me. Uh, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these among you, you did not do it to me. First off, what group here is the desired object of Jesus' concern and of our compassion and service? The least of these. The last, lost, least, lonely, broken, forgotten, forsaken. The hurting and the grieving and the vulnerable those taunted, scorned, or mocked, the last person picked on the playground. Historically speaking, those without power or voice, the marginalized, women, black and brown people, immigrants and refugees, the LGBT community, those incarcerated, those disabled or differently abled. What number in that group does Jesus mention here? One. One of the least of these. You don't have to save the whole world, my friends. Save one. You don't have to feed the world. Feed one. You can't protect everybody. Protect one. And finally, notice that Jesus doesn't liken himself to the least of these as much as equate himself to them. As you have done to them, you have done to me. And as you have not done to them, you have not done to me. When we bless our sisters and brothers in need, we bless Jesus. When we ignore, dismiss, or hurt them, we ignore, dismiss, and hurt Jesus. The concluding verse 46, and these goats will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous sheep into eternal life. Towards the end of his Sermon on the Mount, my friends, back in chapter 7, Jesus said, catch this, this is interesting, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but rather the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. So that begs the question, well, what is God's will? O on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? And I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Translation, when did we not do it, Lord? There are three levels 
of increasing reaction to God's word as I read it in the Bible. Number one, King Herod Antipas has imprisoned John the Baptist, you may recall, whom he will eventually put to death by beheading. It says there that Herod heard him. He was much perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. He heard him. He was much perplexed, but he heard him gladly. That's stage number one. You hear God's word. You are perplexed by it. Don't quite understand it yet. And yet you hear it gladly. You are intrigued. You are interested. You are curious. That's a King Herod reaction. And number two, after Jesus is resurrected on that original Easter, he travels with two of his disciples, one of whom is named Clopas, on the road to Emmaus, but they don't recognize him. Only later does he reveal himself to them in their supper together, after which the disciples say, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us and opened the scriptures to us on the road? Herein you hear the word, your heart burns within, but you don't yet see Jesus for who he is. That's a Cleopas reaction. And number three, in the book of James, it enjoins us, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, because a hearer forgets, but a doer acts, and the doer shall be blessed in his doing. The doer of the word shall be blessed in his doing. That's a James reaction. You are blessed when you feed the hungry. You are blessed giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, welcoming the stranger, visiting the sick and in prison. They might be filled, but you are blessed. They might be embraced and warmed and comforted, but you're the one who is being blessed. And the more blessed you become, the more you go from King Herod to Cleopas to James, from perplexed to your heart burning to a doer who acts, the more sheep-like you become. You become so reflexive in your loving, so spontaneous in your giving, so natural in your serving, so unthinking in your generosity, so tireless in your ministry, so joyful in your compassion and your provision, so unstinting in your self-emptying, so indefatigable in your discipleship. The next thing you know, you look up and say, was that me? When did I do that? How much did I give again? To how many people? When was it that I did that? When was it that I did that? When was it again? When was it? Indeed. Amen. We ask that you please rise as you're able. So we join together in singing our hymn of the day for this Christ the King Sunday. All hail the power of Jesus' name.
Living together in trust and hope, we profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us turn our hearts to God, <coughs> our breath and life, as we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Holy God, from Christ we receive our call to feed, clothe, and welcome. Direct your church to respond to this call with faithfulness and generous love. We pray for the work of ELCA World Hunger and partnerships with Global Feeding Ministries. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In Christ, the rock of our salvation, <clears throat> we are brought into union with all of creation, with mountains, seas, dry lands, and animals of the field. We seek your guidance and protection. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In Christ, we know merciful judgment. Guide rulers of every nation in ways of humble leadership and wise decision-making. Allow aid to come to all who are underserved <coughs> and care to any who are neglected. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In Christ, we feel the depth of your love and care toward us. Nourish all who hunger. Connect any who are isolated and surround all who experience rejection or abuse. We pray for those who suffer. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In Christ we are made the people of his pasture. Inspire the outreach and social ministries of this congregation. We pray for all people who serve and attend to the needs of others. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy God, in Christ we are welcomed home. We praise you for the faithful witness of those who have served you and extended your welcome and love to us. Unite us with them as one body of Christ. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We continue to pray, O oh Lord, for the return of all hostages and for the end of war in Ukraine, Israel, and Palestine. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, Your mercy is, is great. great. We lift to you now, dear Lord, those for whom we have special concern, either silently upon our hearts or aloud upon our lips, and we pray for healing, wisdom, and peace. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. We offer our spoken prayers and those held in our hearts, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and also, also with you. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another now, as well as with those online, via the back cameras, and more personally, up at the front monitor. God's peace be with you.
Jesus instructs us in his most famous sermon of all, the Sermon on the Mount, not to lay up for ourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. Rather, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven because there neither moth nor rust consume and thieves do not and cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you have not already given online, we invite you to join with me now in making presentation of all of our tithes and offerings unto the Lord via the offering plates in the back. We thank you very much. Please rise for our offertory. Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord. Let us pray. God of all goodness, generations have turned to you, gathered around your table, and shared your abundant blessings. Number us among them, that as we gather these gifts from your abundance and give thanks for your rich blessings, we may feast upon your very self and care for all that you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and servant. Amen. <clears throat> We celebrate together now the Lord's Supper, the Feast of Holy Communion. And now may the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your hearts. 
We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Scripture tells us that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the, new cup, is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we now pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There is a place for you at the banquet. Come and feast at Jesus' table. You may be seated for the distribution. All are invited to the Lord's table. All are welcome at the Lord's table. Small children who do not yet receive communion are invited forward for a blessing. We do have a gluten-free option. If that is your preference, please let me know as I approach you, and that will be accommodated. We ask only that you follow the directions found printed in your bulletin and of the ushers.
Please rise to receive our post-communal blessing. And now may the eating of Christ's body and the drinking of his blood strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this simple meal you have set a banquet. Sustain us on the journey. Strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children. And give us glad and generous hearts as we meet you on the way. Amen. <clears throat> Please remain standing for just a couple of mission opportunities and announcements. Did y'all hear how Lois, by the way, Lois, thank you for supplying for Reagan today, who is away for Thanksgiving. Did you hear? <clears throat> Did anyone hear or notice how she concluded the second hymn? With what? Ah, man. And it, it, it threw me. And did you, I don't know if you did that on Force of Habit or because it's a great hymn. But it, I, all of a sudden it occurred to me, I've not heard that since I was a young boy. And I remember, Carol Mason's here right somewhere, and, and Mar, Martha Bulk Knight. But I remember every hymn used to end with us singing um, every single hymn. And now I don't, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but... <laughs> Through history, we stopped doing it. So when you did it, it threw me back to a time when I was young and, and, and you know, more vigorous than I am today. So thank you for that, Lois, so much. That was, that was a great feeling. Um, pledge cards. If you have filled out financial pledge cards already, we thank you so very much. Uh, if you have not, we do ask that you would please do so today. Uh, we have a little bit of ground to make up for our upcoming proposed budget next month. So thank you if you already have. If not, please do so today, and you can leave them in the offering plates as you leave. Uh, Pastor's Bible Study continues on Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. and 6.45 p.m. in the music room just down the hall here. We do have a Zoom option available for you if you are unable to attend in person. Uh, as you know by now, the topic of this year's Bible Study is the basics of Christian belief. The basics of Christian belief. And specifically this week, we'll be talking about that word, believe. How much do you know about what you believe. How important is it to you? What constitutes that belief? And what are its implications or consequences? If you'd like to know more, let's study that together. Wednesday, 10.30 a.m., 6.45 p.m. And last but not least, as we said uh, earlier today, today is Christ the King Sunday. It ends the Christian liturgical year year, which means next week we gather to begin a Christian liturgical year with the first Sunday in what season? Advent. Advent. We look forward to seeing you uh, next week as we kick off our Advent season together. Uh, at this time, receive the benediction of our Lord. And now may the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign Savior and Spirit, be with you today and always. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn, this great Christ the King Sunday, is crown him with many crowns.
partners in ministry, what is our mission? Jesus asked that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Answering that call, may you go in peace and share the love of Christ. Thanks be to God.